Okay, mercy on the mountain. How appropriate a message this will be today. Mercy on the mountain, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we're going to take a look at this incredible beatitude. But before we do, if you're visiting today or you've been here for the last series of weeks, I want to give you a brief recap. The context is the Jews in first century Palestine, which is a derivative of the word Philistine, are a people without a nation, without a government. They are oppressed by Romans. They are taxed and taxed and taxed. The prevailing attitude among the Jews is they need to rebel, to revolt, some of which want to do so militarily. Others want a Messiah to come, a new king, to set up a new kingdom called Israel uh, and to breach or break themselves from the oppressive rule of Romans. There is some persecution going on and the people are not happy and they want a revolution. And who enters the picture but Jesus himself, the single most successful revolutionary to ever walk the earth. But his revolution does not in any way, shape, or form take on the type of revolution that people are looking for. So he one day, as his public ministry starts, he sees the multitudes and he goes up on a mountain and he sits down and the disciples come to him and he begins to teach them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. To those people, what would that have meant? It would have been crazy to say such a thing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are spiritually impoverished. Blessed are those who are at the end of their rope. Blessed are those who are at the end of themselves so God can begin something new in them. Blessed are those who are famished for some reality of God. Blessed are those who are empty. Blessed are those who have no answers, but seek the one who does. Blessed are those who are not about themselves. Blessed are those who are not selfish. Blessed are those who are God-minded, word-minded. Blessed are those who know they have a need of a savior and a personal revolution before a national one. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of heaven is love, it's hugs, it's laughter, it's joy, it's purpose, it's meaning, it's direction, it's wisdom, it's worship, it's clarity, it's purpose and meaning in life, it's a fulfillment, it's an abundance, it's a kingdom that is within. Build the kingdom within before you want a national kingdom, he's saying. Then he goes on to say, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who grieve, who has a sensitivity to God, who grieve, who are pricked in their heart about sin in their life. Blessed are those who realize something must die, and it is the sin, the transgression of God's law. Quicken and sensitive and weep like Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, the guy who's empty, the woman who's empty, and the man or the woman who mourns, who, who grieves with the Spirit of God over the state of their personal life or their, or their inadequacy or their indiscretion or their lustful appetites or their addictions or for you alcoholics, for you compulsive people, it is bottom. Blessed are those who mourn. The very Beatitudes I'm quoting to you this morning are the very foundation of Celebrate Recovery. I drop by there on Tuesdays to see how things are going. People are starting to come from this community to find out how to get free from compulsive, addictive behavior. I love it. And if you have such, or you think you may have such issues, you come over there Tuesday and hang out again with us, and we'll figure out how to get you free. Amen? With the greatest level of anonymity you've ever seen. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, he goes on to say, blessed are the meek. I tell you what, meek was the number one word spoken at my house this week. And Sunday afternoon in particular. Anybody throw that word around, meek? Thought about this meekness concept? The only word left in the English language we haven't ruined, it still has an original meaning. We haven't trounced it. We haven't diluted it. It's still there, meek. Yes, lowly. Yes, humble. Yes, gentle. Oh, but abandoned 
away from self, set apart, a power under control that comes in a man or woman's life out of a spiritual maturity that comes under the authority of God and remains there for under the authority of God, the meek are in the safest place they can ever be. Meek. About the other, about glorifying God. Jesus on a donkey riding into Jerusalem is the definition of meekness. His face like flint to the cross. Riding on a humble donkey, knowing he'd be pierced and afflicted and spit upon and embarrassed. Meek. Meekness, the meekness we need in our marriages, the meekness we need in our teenagers, the meekness we need in our parents, the meekness we need as a witness in this country, a church that understands and exemplifies and manifests meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then once you're spiritually poor, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I mean, the guy who, who cries out to the Father, this is what I want. This is what I want. And a father listens to a child say, how many of you dads that listen to your kids say, this is what I want, Dad, this is what I really, 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 really want. And you rattle the, the, the screen door of heaven today and you cry out for what you really, 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 really want and it's not a yacht or a Porsche, but it's righteousness, somebody better get out of your way because things are about to happen. If you cry out and rattle that screen door of heaven for righteousness, I want a hunger and a thirst for righteousness and that's all I want, righteousness. I want to be right with God, I want to walk right with God, I want to be in line with what God has for me. All the blessings of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness will be added unto you. You wouldn't have time to ask God for anything else but righteousness because he'd be giving you everything you ever wanted to ask for in the meantime. I want a hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what Jesus is saying to a people who want to revolt against a bunch of people with swords and shields. You want a revolution? You cry out to God for righteousness. Righteousness, man, that's what he's talking about. That's the revolutionary. And then, we come to today, mercy, mercy. The year's about five, 587, somewhere in there, give or take a year. Babylonians have Jerusalem under a 19 month siege, the most horrific kind of warfare known to man. 19 months of being holed up within the walls of Jerusalem with nothing to eat, little to drink, the precious wealth of the city is tarnished and strewn throughout the streets like unwanted litter. Some of you have been to Jerusalem. You know what it's like to see the, the brilliance of the stone and the life of the people and the diversity of the cultures and the excitement of, of what's going on, people praying at the Wailing Wall. It's a beautiful sight, Jerusalem is. But on this day in Lamentations, it wasn't. And the people of the city, though worth much more than gold, are treated like valueless clay pots. Furthermore, the Jewish adults have become like cruel animals, refusing to care for the needs of the children. Mothers have even begun to kill, boil, and eat their own children. Those who were rich and important have been stripped of their wealth and dignity. The once handsome and healthy civic leaders are now wandering the streets, barely recognizable because of their blackened and shriveled bodies, which are racked by hunger. The lowest point in the history of Jerusalem as quoted by Charles Swindoll in Lamentations of Jeremiah. The rebellion of a people against God time and time and time and time again yielded them the consequences of a withdrawal of his protection. And yet in the middle of it all, though they were after the prophet trying to kill him, Jeremiah the weeping prophet says, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. To say that in the midst of that going on is a guy that somehow had something in touch with mercy. I don't, 
I don't know. I, I have a hard time fathoming that. That, is, that, that, that goes beyond, you know, Auschwitz in some re respects. It, it, it is the siege warfare of Jerusalem that I think is the, the single lowest point on the earth, not physically Jericho, but the spiritual low point of a people. And they cry out to God and say his mercies are new every morning. What is this mercy this God has for us? What is this mercy? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Well, what exactly is mercy? Mercy withholds punishment. Consequences always exist. Mercy withholds punishment. But it also extends compassion. All right, let's talk about that. To understand mercy, you have to understand grace. The word charis, Greek, meaning gift, grace, always deals with sin and guilt. Grace extends to someone a pardon. This is why the word grace always, almost always comes before mercy in the Bible. You must first have grace to have mercy. All right, grace must go before mercy. Alios is a noun that's being used here, and mercy is, mercy is something you use in the presence of pain, misery, and distress. It's very important that we understand this. Pain, misery, and distress. To withhold a punishment, do that person in pain, misery, or distress is mercy. Or to extend to that person compassion in their pain, misery, and distress is mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The greatest uh, way I could define mercy for you is this. Uh, you know what sympathy is and empathy is. Sympathy is, is pity. Empathy is pity, but it's empathy is putting yourself inside the skin of a person who's hurt you or wronged you and feeling what they feel. Everybody get that? Someone here maybe has really, really betrayed me, wronged me, slandered me, and they're in great pain and distress. Something caused that person to do what they did. Mercy says, I'm going to get inside that person's skin and find out the context of their motivation and hurt with them. That's mercy. And God's mercies are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness. But I can't get in someone else's skin, and I can't feel everything someone else is feeling. Yes, but check this out. God is a God of mercy, for Jesus Christ came and got in our skin and felt what we felt and understood our pain, our distress, and our agony and became one of us. John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the disciple said, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. We worship the God this morning, a God of mercy, who came in the form of a man inside our skin to feel what we felt, not to have knowledge of it from a distance, not to guess, but to experience fatigue, temptation, abuse, betrayal, loss of a loved one, death of a loved one, ridicule, slander, blasphemy, religiosity, Mercy, we serve and worship a God of mercy. He came and got in our skin. One thing that would do us well when someone's wronged us. You know, sometimes we have to take into consideration that we are not at the center of the universe, though it feels like we should be sometimes. And when someone has wronged us, cheated us, stole from us, whatever it may be, we must all understand on some level that that person can have a diminished capacity. At the time that they did it, they had a diminished capacity to do what they were supposed to do. You know, we're the first, not we, the world is the first to get on someone's case. This is why, you know, racial profiling, racism, expectation, this, this whole thing is really comes down to this in our culture. And it repeats itself in cycles. It really comes down to this. There is an element of understanding of why we live in the world today, as violent as it is, if we got in someone else's skin and realized they'd never seen anything different than violence. 
They've never left a one and one half mile circle from their home and they're, they're, they've been taught how to be violent. They've taught how to be steel. They've taught that they're less than. They have a diminished capacity to see beyond the island in which we live. And all of us live on an island. Mercy says, I'll go there out of fairness. I'll go there and I'll try to experience. This is Jesus. I'll go there, Father, and I'll experience what they experience. I'll become one of them. I'll die as one of them. I'll represent them. I'll be the sinless man that'll pay the price for all of those who really deserve punishment. I'll withhold the punishment while I'll extend compassion, the merciful God. It would do us well as a Christian witness. And I hope this doesn't fall like water on a duck's back. It would do us well to, to, to hold back from our, our comments that seem to be right on the tip of our tongue and stop being so reactive about things and think, 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 think. Because this world is becoming so emotional and so lust-driven and so emotion-driven and so race-driven that no one's thinking. You've got to think in these days. You've got to step back and you will be heard when you actually have tested both sides of a story and you introduce into it a wisdom that comes from God. Our world would be a better place if the church would think more and feel less and do more as we think more and feel more as we do for others. Mercy, blessed are the mercifuls, for they shall receive mercy. Then you say, well, I'm not, I'm not getting a whole lot of mercy. Anybody feel that way? Ain't a whole lot of mercy coming my way. Well, the implication here is, maybe you're not giving a lot out. Ouch. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That's the Bible, not me. You realize that. I think you brought me here to teach the Bible. Blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. Now, these Beatitudes, the cool thing about this sermon, which makes it so great, is that he's basically given us a table of contents for the rest of the sermon. He's going to back up every point he's got here about mercy and poor in spirit and forgiving others and peacemaking and all this stuff. He's going to give us a whole sermon with illustrations to boot that are going to back up what he's saying right here. He's going to get to merciful. He's going to deal with it in a few weeks in a sermon. But in Matthew 17, 18, he, re he revisits the whole subject. The un Merciful, the unforgiving servant who owed great deal of money and was forgiven the debt, yet left debtor's prison to go hammer someone else for much less money. He didn't get mercy. No, he didn't get any mercy. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on him and his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him? He'll deal, Jesus will deal with this issue again about mercy and forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer coming up in about 15 minutes into his sermon. And it says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, Matthew 6 and 12. There is this tit for tat, there is this correlation, there is this relationship between being with an attitude, be attitude, to being that who you've been called to be and receiving as well. The Christian disciple who's mature doesn't go out and ask for blessings. They seek first the kingdom and they receive the blessing. The mature Christian extends mercy when it's countercultural and if you pay a price for it and ends up receiving mercy. The, the, the mature Christian who's poor in spirit understands their lack of capacity to be who God called them to be apart from Christ. The man who mourns over his own sin can extend mercy to another who's a sinner and not pass judgment on him. The guy who is poor in spirit and mourns over his own sin will first take the plank out of his eye before he points out the speck in his brother's. These beatitudes are the way to live. Listen, if you want to change, if you want a revolution in your life, if you're listening or watching on that camera, you're listening on a CD, if you want to change, this sermon is being laid in your lap. Pick it up and take it and do what is asked of you. Your life will become change. You will become a new person. The old will pass away and the new will blossom. 
It's right here in this text. One sermon's all you need. It'll turn your marriage around, it'll turn your family around, it'll turn your business around. Jesus said, those who put these words into practice will be like a house built upon a rock. If you're wavering, double-minded, all over the map, going in cycles, up and down, all over the place, and you look back over the last 20 years of your life and there's not a solid stream of intent, hunger, appetite, blessing, direction, wisdom, fruit, and fruit that will last. It's right here, my friend. Get into this sermon. Don't let it go. I'll do my part. You do yours. This is the deal right here, man. It's right there for you. Said another way. If it's all in but no out, and you're not mentoring anybody, and you're not pouring and investing in anybody else, Well, if I have to explain it, you're not ready. Why is mercy so important in culture? God is mercy, and Christ in culture is a revolution. How how countercultural is this first century statement? It is the single most countercultural you could say to this group of people. So, what's the application for my life? What is the application? in my life? This is a great question. Well, we've already found out this morning, have we not? I see now why this is so timely. Perhaps someone that used to be in this church was divided over some petty issue or whatever the heck was going on here, and there's not a reconciliation there. Perhaps a little dialogue over a cup of coffee and getting inside one another's skin to experience a different point of view might be the difference to extending compassion and asking for forgiveness. It must be an issue. Blessed are the merciful, so they shall attain mercy. And then he goes on to say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Oh, this is bizarre. Faith is the evidence of things not yet seen. Hebrews 11 Jesus now is talking about, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What is this? All right, there's two definitions of pure. Let's take that word out for a spin. Pure, in one sense, means clean, just as you would think. Someone who has a clean heart, a pure heart, a purified heart. Uh, Purified by what? Purified by fire. You know when you heat up silver, the dross comes to the top, you clear off the dross, and you end up with a pure silver. Uh, The tests and the trials that you've had in your life are there for a reason, to do what? To purify your heart. Um, If you're the type of person, as I am sometimes, who doesn't like confrontation and wants to avoid a situation that's difficult and wants to go around something rather than go through it, the, the, the result of that is not as purified a heart as you could have. You've got to face up to whatever it is that's coming your way and you've got to face it head on and you've got to go through it with someone to end up having that pure heart. A pure heart has been purified by fire. This actually is why, in part, you see uh, the Holy Spirit uh, symbolically depicted as fire. There's a purification that takes place in a human heart. And I tell you, I I taught this forgiveness class this past Wednesday. You know, there are some things that are pretty tough to forgive people for. Think about that. I don't want to go into detail, but 25% of you ought to know, based on statistics, some people have been abused and hurt, and it's hard to forgive people for that. And it, it, is, it is an ultimate merciful thing, and it is an ultimate meek thing. It, it is an ultimate power under control. It is extending compassion. It is understanding a diminished capacity in another person. And it is honoring God above your own feelings. Hello. It's honoring God above your own feelings. Purity of heart. Uh, free of a corrupt heart, a desire for sin or falsehood. Uh, falsehood will corrupt your heart. Sin will corrupt your heart. But a pure heart, he's, he's giving you a picture of something very clean, very pristine, very unencumbered, very free. Uh, like a vine cleansed by pruning. You know, some of you are pruning right now. That's good. Pruning is purifies. Cut off the dead. That's good stuff. 
What is, now here's a blank for you. What is the connection between purity and the presence of the Lord? You'll notice in, in, my partic- in my ministry here, I keep coming back to the presence of the Lord because I feel like as I talk and counsel with people, there is not yet an experiential understanding of what the presence of the Lord is in a believer's life. Uh, and and this, this is a part of worship, our worship experience. There's a lack of experiential understanding of the presence of God. And sometimes teaching will help us to understand that and look at it in a different way. But it's this, this passage. I'd go back and look at it if I were you. Psalm 24, 3 and 4. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. One of the things that keeps us from not, one of the things that keeps us from sensing the presence of God, I'm talking about the physical presence, the tangible presence, the, 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 where you're overwhelmed physically, that presence. One of the things that keeps us from that is, is, a, is a distraction on things other than Christ or a sin in our own life or a lack of knowledge. Well, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands. There you go. There's a freedom from, from impurity and a clean heart. A clean heart. I'm going to show you how to do that today, by the way. I'm going to try to. All right, the second definition of purity is important. It is a relational context to purity. Purity in the first sense is I'm clean before God. Now, purity in the second sense is I'm, I'm clean and have a clear conscience with others. Remember, there's two great commandments, vertical and horizontal. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. This purity here is between a husband and a wife, a sister and a brother, uh, the guy and the girl next to each other on the pew. It's between all of us. This purity is relational, and it's a... Here's a good word for you. Masklessness. Masklessness. That's this purity. Blessed are the pure in heart. Clean, innocent before God, clear conscience, confess their sin, quicken and sensitive to the presence of God. Now, this other purity is a relational, uh, horizontal masklessness, a true unveiling of who you are and who you are. What you see is actually what you get. There's no act, there's no pretense. What I say about my life, public and private, would be the same. This is difficult, especially if you're a pastor and you're expected to be perfect, or your kids are expected to be perfect. The greatest heresy in the church. It is the masklessness of a Christian in relationship to someone else. In another series, I call it Intimacy, to be know, fully known and to be to know fully intimacy. This masklessness and this purity of heart causes us to experience the presence of God. Where the outward appearances are equal to the inward purity of heart. Where you don't have to play a game to be a certain person in this role and a different person in this one. Where you never have to forget what you said in this conversation to cover yourself in this conversation. That there's no dishonesty in you, so when someone says, didn't you say that, if you know it's not true, you can say, no, I know I didn't say that because that's not true. Truth, masklessness, that's this purity that Jesus is talking about. Utter sincerity. Sincerity comes from uh, buying a vase in a market in Jerusalem If a vase was cracked, you could fill in the cracks, you could sand over it, and you could repaint the vase. But when you held it up to the light, a a trained eye could see that there's still a crack somewhere in that vase. A sincere vase was without cracks. Utter sincerity, transparency. No acting public and private, the same. Uh, The psalmist says, one who does not swear uh, by what is false, by an idol, by a false god. Purity is single-mindedness. Let me say that again. Purity is single-mindedness. Pure in heart, you will see God. Where you're not double-minded. James says a double-minded man is unstable in all he does. A single-minded person takes God at his word, investigates, believes, trusts, acts, and sees things one way, but is open to more truth. Single-mindedness. He's not a skeptic. He's not a Christian one day and not the next. He's not up and down. He's not vacillating. He's mature, but pure in heart. For they will see God. Well, they're going to see God for eternity, but they're also going to see God at work in their life. I I sat down and had, uh, I sat down and had uh, a conversation with a college student not long ago, 
who is, he, this person, is, this student is about to s- is seeing God do things in, in, in his or her life in a way that they haven't seen before. And kind of rapid fire, machine gun kind of characteristic. And they're like, wow, man, I never knew God was like this. And well, they're seeing God, you see. They're seeing God work in their life. That's an exciting thing. Question, have I experienced the presence of God often enough? That has to do with persistence and purity. Persistence and purity. Put that off to the side in your booklet. Persistence and purity will lead to the presence of God in your life. All right, I'm going to tell you a little story. This goes back to 1 Kings chapter 2. This is old school here. Uh, David is perishing. Solomon's going to become king of Israel. Now there's a, there's a brother, Absalom, who's seeking to destroy the whole situation. He wanted to be king. And then there's another brother of Solomon, uh, Adonijah. It, it, he wants to be king. So anyway, the high priest and a guy named Joab are conspiring to make Solomon's brother king and not Solomon. I mean, they're, getting, they're really messing up. They're getting in the way of God here. They're, they're, they're totally wrong, impure. They're totally wrong. Well, the other brother, the older brother who has the potential to be king, he gets caught. And, and what he does is he goes to the horns of the altar. You ever heard this expression, horns of the altar? He gets caught and he goes to the horns of the altar. Well, my guess is it's the altar of incense. It was two cubits high, a cubit's a foot and a half. It's about three foot high. Incense goes out of it day and night. And in, in Revelation, it says the incense is the prayers of the saints. So this guy goes to the altar in the holy place. And he grabs onto the horns of that altar and he won't let go. And he realizes it. Now, Exodus depicts these horns of the altar as a place of mercy. It's also the precedent for and the principle for a city of refuge. If you ever really, really messed up and you wanted to go someplace where you wouldn't be hurt and you would just have refuge for a little while, some people call that a bottle. Some people call it a syringe. This guy called it the horns of the altar. And he went to the horns of the altar to seek safety in that holy place, and he just cried out to God. And Solomon came along and realized his older brother was in there, and his older brother had really messed up. And actually, he extended to him mercy, and the guy lived. Now, Joab, the guy that manipulated the whole situation and created the whole nightmare, he said, well, you know, if that guy went in there and he got mercy, it's only a matter of time before they find me. I'm going in there too. So he goes to the horns of the altar. Joab does. He grabs onto those things. Now, Solomon's older brother went in there, and his outward appearance matched his inward purity of heart. And because of that, he saw God move in his life, and he was extended mercy. Joab went in there, and he grabbed the horns of the altar, and it was a joke. His outward appearance did not in any way, shape, or form match his inward purity of heart. He did not see God move on his benefit. He did not experience a place of refuge. In fact, he was killed. Grabbing the horns of the altar is something I want you to get familiar with. Sometimes if it helps you, if you get at the foot of your bed, for those of you who have a twin bed, you grab the, bed, the footboard. That's the horns of the altar. For others of you, you just you physically grab something like you're at the horn of the altar there and you don't let go. You grab the horns of the altar and you begin to pray. Now, what are you praying? Purity of heart. Extending mercy. I'm hungry for righteousness. I could use a little mercy to extend to others. I want to acknowledge my own poverty of spirit at times. I want to be a mature Christian. I want to be who you've called me to be. In fact, I already am that. Please, God, remove that which impedes that reality. You know the story of Michelangelo finding a big rock in a quarry that had been passed up time and time and time again? People looked at it and they said, it's fractured, it's no good inside, it's not going to work. Artists, sculptors passed on that time and time again. Michelangelo looked at that rock and he saw David. All he needed to do is remove from that rock what wasn't David. The the mature Christian that Jesus is going to use to revolutionize the world is one who realized they already are blessed. They already are poor in spirit. They already are merciful. They already are hungry. Let's just remove that which isn't so we can be who we already are. That's, That's it right there. 
you grab the horns of that altar right there, that place of refuge, and you can say, God, I, I, I don't want to leave here till I experience your presence. I want to see you. I want a purified heart. And these beatitudes become your language. When you start praying the word of God, you're praying the will of God. When you pray the will of God, the will of God comes to pass. You don't let go. This is why from 12.01 a.m. on August 5th to midnight on August 11th, your pastor is affording you an opportunity to grab the horns of an altar and not let go. Free of distraction. In a place of refuge. Now, some of you will have the capacity to know what I'm talking about more than others. Some of you have are green behind the ears and wet behind the ears. You just became a Christian. That's okay, man. Grab the horns of the altar and don't let go. And watch yourself be enveloped by the presence of God. Watch yourself becoming more pure at heart. Watch yourself seeing those who have wronged you in a different light. Watch yourself extending compassion where, where you would pass judgment previously. Watch yourself quickened and sensitive and weeping over the own transgressions in your own life. Watch yourself withholding judgment from other people. Watch that plank in your eye become a two by four, become a speck. Watch that purity of heart see God move in your life. Watch you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's happening in people's lives here. I hear the testimonies. I sit with you men on Tuesday. I see it happening in your life. Keep hold of the horns of the altar and don't let go. And make your outward behavior parallel your inward reality. If that helps you, that's your action step for today. That is your action step for today. Who hurt you? Who wronged you? Who abandoned you? Who betrayed you? Who committed adultery against you? Who stole from you? Who hurt you may be you. Mercy. Mercy. It's, it's a level of a reality of the Christian life that is different than we actually see in our lives today. It's different than we see as a witness in our country. It's different, but my friend, it's also effective and it's revolutionary. This is what I'm gonna do. <clears throat> I'm gonna share the gospel with you. Ansley, one of our incredible, one of the many credible people we met down at Western Carolina is gonna sing a song for us. She's played in our coffee house down there on a few occasions. She has such a tender heart. I'm gonna share the gospel. I'm gonna believe that someone's gonna receive it. After she sings this song, I'm going to ask you to receive Christ. Some of you have never received Christ before. Let me explain. The day will come for every person in this room when we will perish, apart from a rapture. And you're going to be standing there, and you're going to be in need of mercy. You're going to be looking at a God who's full of mercy. And the reality is this. Is he going to look at you and say, depart from me, I never knew you? Or is he going to look at you, unlike he did Joab, and say, I know you messed up. I know you sinned. But out of mercy, I sent my son to get into your skin, to live as a human and understand the frailty and the weakness associated with it. And since you cried out to me and asked Jesus Christ to be the penalty for your sin, you'll not pay that penalty today. That's what's going to happen. That, either, that, is going to trans, that transaction is going to take place in heaven, or he's going to look at you like he looked at Joab. You look good. You're standing here looking right. But I provided you the most merciful thing I could ever provide, and I had it explained to you in multiple ways, and yet you still to this day have rejected it, and you may be grabbing the horns of the altar asking for mercy, but as I look deep inside your heart, I do not see the purity of a devotion, of a worship to a Savior who died on your behalf and rose from the dead. It's a, it's a sobering moment. 
If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you'll go the way of Joab. You can even attend church every Sunday and get in the holy place. Go through the motion. Grab the altar. But somewhere deep down in here, you still remain the Lord of your own life, control of your own destiny, Lord of your own rationalizations. And I love you enough this morning to tell you you are dead wrong. You will have eternal life. I just am not positive where you're spending. So if the Lord pricked your heart today and you'd like some of this eternal mercy and you like that fullness that I'm talking about that is, comes from an authentic relationship with Christ, you think about that as you hear these words and I'm gonna ask you to pray. I'll pray for you in a little bit.